This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. Sharks have patrolled the seas for millions of years and remain one of the apex predators on our planet. From the Middle Miocene period to Middle Pliocene, roughly 3.5 million to 16 million years ago, a giant shark ancestor, Odotus megalodon, is believed to have been the king of the ocean. We know about the megalodon mostly because it left behind these absolutely gigantic fossil teeth. And it reached lengths of more than 15 meters, so you can think of a shark the length of a city bus, which is really pretty ridiculous. Supported in part by NSF, a multi-institutional effort by or including researchers at William Patterson, DePaul, UCLA, UC Merced, and Princeton universities, used a unique geochemical method to get a greater understanding of Megalodon's place in the ancient food web. The group, including Emma Cast, a 2019 PhD graduate in geosciences and first author on this study, found that by drilling into the highly mineralized enameloid layer of shark teeth, they could withdraw surviving organic material. And by measuring the nitrogen-15 molecules within those samples, they could establish an understanding of what the long extinct sharks were eating. Dr. Cast, how did you find out what the megalodon was eating? So we have some understanding of what they're eating from things like a uh, few very cool examples of fossil marine mammal bones that actually have bite marks from megalodon teeth. So telling us that at some point in the past, there was a megalodon who chomped down on that marine mammal. I guess perhaps to like paint a picture of the marine food web. If you think about the very bottom, there's things like, like phytoplankton. And then as you move up, you get things that eat phytoplankton. Uh, so like a copepod, if you've ever heard of a copepod, so like zooplankton. And then you get into like the small fish and the medium fish. Um, and then at the top of the food web in the modern ocean, uh, you have things like really large sharks, like great white sharks, um, and also some marine mammals like orcas. So we actually looked kind of inside the tooth. And in particular, there's this, this layer of the tooth. And it's very similar to the enamel layer on our teeth. So this kind of outside layer of your tooth. And kind of in between these mineral crystals, there ends up being these really tiny, tiny amounts of organic matter that are kind of trapped within the mineral of the tooth. The super nice thing for us and other researchers looking at this kind of stuff is that that organic matter is actually preserved inside that tooth on millions of year time scales. So we can go to these fossil teeth and basically drill out some of the enameloid. We clean them super well to get rid of anything on the outside. And then we basically dissolve away the mineral and we end up with the organic matter, the nitrogen that's in these fossil teeth. Basically what we found in this study is that the megalodon was probably two steps above kind of our top modern marine predators. So they were probably eating things that were even higher in the food web than uh, great whites and orcas and things like that we have in the modern ocean. The nitrogen levels also tell us that as the megatooth sharks evolved, their diet shifted with the highest trophic level or position in the food chain appearing to have been reached earlier than the peak physical size of the sharks. This could point to a rise in competition as the megalodon swam towards extinction. Dr. Kast, do we know why megalodon went extinct? This is a challenging question and I th part of wanting to understand what they ate is about this question of uh, why they went extinct. So some of the possible explanations are about their dietary items also went extinct and then therefore that caused their extinction. So there's one idea that the megalodon was eating these kind of small filter feeding baleen whales and that those types of baleen whales went extinct around the time of the megalodon extinction. And I would say that we can't necessarily pin down exactly why the megalodon went extinct, but what we can do is exclude some explanations. So based on our work, we really don't think it's possible that the megalodon was eating those kind of filter feeding baleen whales because they're actually quite low in the food web. And we know that the megalodon was really high. Another great possible explanation for the megalodon extinction was actually a competition between great white sharks this idea that as the kind of great white sharks evolved during this time period, they started to outcompete uh, the megalodon. 
I would say that based on our work, we don't think that there is a direct competition between adult Megalodon and adult white sharks. However, I don't want to rule out a competition between baby Megalodons or juvenile Megalodons and great white sharks. So I think there's definitely still a potential connection there and some competition dynamics that might have led to Megalodon's extinction. What do you think is so captivating about these giant sharks? So if you like look at your hand and you think about a triangle going from like the bottom of your thumb across to the other side of your palm all the way up to your middle finger, that's like the size of these fossil teeth. One of my collaborators, Harry Meish, he is a diver and there's places you can go in the US, for example, in North Carolina, you can go diving and find Megalodon teeth. The other thing that I think is just so captivating about sharks is just how long they've been around. They were around before dinosaurs, they've been around after dinosaurs. They've really been like a pervasive group of animals in the ocean for hundreds of millions of years. We also had the chance to speak with paleontologist Bruce McFadden, curator and professor at the Florida Museum of Natural History at the University of Florida. Professor McFadden, can you tell me about the Miocene and Pliocene eras when Megalodon was around? It was a time when the Earth's climate really went into cycles of glacial and interglacials back around, you know, several million years ago. It was a time when the Isthmus of Panama closed finally at about three or four million years ago. And that fundamentally changed oceanic circulation. But indeed, there were some animals that were living in the oceans back when Megalodon was around that were really interesting, the ancestors of modern great white sharks, but also some really cool, like for example, aquatic sloths. So you think about sloths today living in trees in, in the neotropical forest of the Americas. And uh, there were fossil sloths that were coastal ocean dwellers that lived alongside Megalodon. Following from that closure of the Isthmus of Panama, can you tell me a little bit about your experiences in Panama? I would say the Pyre was my favorite NSF proposal for a variety of reasons. That was a project where we were looking at the kinds of animals that used to live on land and in the oceans uh, between about 22 and about 5 to 10 million years ago. Panama was undergoing a major transformation. They were renovating some of the old canals and they were building a new branch of the canals. They were penetrating fossiliferous deposits along the Panama Canal. That was a really exciting project. We had over 100 participants, early career professional paleontologists, interns. I brought teachers to Panama with me for five years so they could experience collecting fossils in the ancient neotropics. So it was a really, really good project. Can you tell me about some of the finds you had there? Oh yeah, so ancient sea cow-like animals. We got lots of megalodon from 10 million year old sediments from what are called the Gatun Formation. A huge biodiversity of extinct mollusks from that area. So we had the marine component. And then on land, we're getting land animals like rhinoceroses in Panama and fossil horses and deer-like animals. And those are animals that disperse into lower latitude tropical areas. So we were getting really interesting animals, both related to the marine life, but also the, the terrestrial fauna that used to live in the ancient rainforest. We were able to look, look at the carbon isotopes of their teeth and, and tell you something about the kinds of forests that they lived in during this time. So it really was an interesting project from a paleontological and geochemical aspect. You mentioned learning about what these ancient creatures were eating from their teeth. Can you tell me a little bit about that process in your study? We grind up a little part of their enamel in their teeth, and in the enamel in the teeth is preserved carbon ratios, different isotopes of carbon, and that tells us the kind of plant foods they were eating. Because leaves off trees photosynthesize carbon in one way, and the carbon is photosynthesized in grasses, on the other hand, in a totally different way. So we can discriminate browsers from grazers based on the carbon isotope ratios in their teeth that was preserved in the fossils for millions of years. And that was a major part of my research for several decades. Finally, what do you think it is about Megalodon that captures the imagination? I have to say that with all the work I've been doing with Megalodon, 
and the just the excitement that you can generate. Kids and people with childlike curiosity are just fascinated with things that are big and scary and no longer here. Think about dinosaurs. So to me, Megalodon is the dinosaur of the ocean in terms of public appeal. And I should tell you that what's really cool right now is we're, we have an NSF project out of EHR called an eye test project where we're using fossil sharks as an entree to understand about machine learning and artificial intelligence. It really is exciting, the fact that you had this gigantic predator that no longer exists and leaves these fabulous teeth. To me, that's really exciting. So I would say, although I'm perhaps, I've done a lot of academic research on fossil horses, I really do think that Megalodon is pretty darn cool. Special thanks to Dr. Emma Cast, Professor Bruce McFadden, Terrence Affer Anderson, Adam Eggers, and Dean Ethley. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.